Hello. Over the next several videos, I will be reading the historical fictional novel, Elephant Run by Roland Smith. I will include commentary for the historical and cultural context. Let's begin. When our story begins, Nick Freestone, a 14 year old boy, is living in London, England with his mother during World War II. Part one, the plantation. When Nick Freestone was young, he and his mother lived on a farm in Kansas. They weren't there long, but what Nick remembered the most about the time there were the violent thunderstorms that washed over the cornfields during the night. The noise and lightning were terrifying, but it was nothing like the bombs that dropped from the night skies of London, where he and his mother were living in 1941. The Nazis called the bombing raids Blitzkrieg, or Lightning War. The British simply called it the Blitz. Every night, the German Luftwaffe droned across the channel, the noise distant at first, then closer, followed by the womp womp of bombs hitting buildings. It was dark in the subway tunnels, where they took shelter, which was just as well. This way, no one saw the other's fear. They sat on benches, shoulder to shoulder, thigh to thigh, with their heads down and eyes squeezed shut against the dust shaken from the ceiling. Some prayed, some crossed their fingers, some did both, hoping the bombs would fall on someone else. When the all clear siren sounded, they walked calmly upstairs to the street. Some of the people made jokes, others chatted about the weather or food rationing. No one talked about the blitz or the smoke in the air or the red glow of burning buildings in the distance until November 30th. The siren sounded a little after midnight. Groggily, Nick got out of bed and joined their housekeeper, Mrs. Knowles, in the underground station down the street. His mother was at work at the American embassy. His stepfather, Bernard, an army intelligence officer, was on a secret mission somewhere in France. When the all clear sounded, they walked up the stairs. As soon as they stopped outside, Mrs. Knowles screamed, <gasps> joined by several others. At first, Nick didn't know what all the fuss was about. Then he saw the fire. A thermite incendiary bomb had hit his apartment building. There were small bombs, 18 inches long, weighing only a couple of pounds, but the Luftwaffe dropped them in something called a bread basket that carried 72 bombs at a time. The fire brigade was already there, but it was too late. His mother arrived in an embassy car for an hour later and took him back to her office. He slept on her sofa. The next morning, Nick and his mother went back to the apartment. There wasn't much left. Were you able to contact Bernard? Nick asked. She shook her head. Bernard had been gone for nearly a month behind enemy lines. She was worried about him. So was Nick. What are we going to do now? His mother looked at him with her beautiful green eyes. She pointed at the charred remains of their apartment. Before this happened, I talked to your father, she said. Nick was surprised. There were few phones in Burma and none on the teak plantation his father owned. The situation in Burma is unstable, she continued, but things are worse here. He thinks you would be safer with him. Nick held his breath. After a long pause, his mother said, I agree with your father. I am sending you to Burma. Chapter One, Burma. You were born on a hot Burmese day without a breath of wind, Nang shouted above the engine noise as he steered the old truck along the narrow dirt road. When you came into the world, you screamed so loud we heard you in the elephant village. He paused to stick a chair root in his mouth, but he didn't take both hands off the wheel to light it to Nick's relief. I was in the village because my wife was expecting Mia, who came along three weeks after you were born. 
he glanced at his daughter, who was sitting between them, dodged a rather large boulder in the road, narrowly missing it. I rode my elephant deep into the forest to find your father and his catching crew. We returned to Hawk's Nest two days later, leading a beautiful young elephant. You were a week early and your father was two days late. He shook his head. That was when the big trouble began between your mother and father. After that, she did not like him anymore. Uh, she likes him, Nick said, which wasn't exactly true. That's why you were named Nicholas Gillis Freestone, Nang continued, instead of Jackson Theodore Freestone, the fourth. That was your father's punishment for being late. Gillis is my mother's maiden name, Nick said. Yes, but if it had been up to your father, you would have been named after him, your grandfather and your great-great-grandfather. Nick gripped the dash as Nang maneuvered the truck around a hairpin curve with a drop-off of at least 500 feet. Smiling with relief as they made it safely around the curve, Nang added, but your father did get to name the elephant he captured that day. He, he called him Hannibal. After a week on boats, trains, and airplanes, Nick was finally back home and already he felt more comfortable than he had ever felt in London, or America for that matter. Nang and his daughter had picked him up at the Rangoon Airport on a flatbed truck with a very large elephant named Ma Chu, or Miss Pretty. His father had bought her from another plantation. She was certainly pretty, with long legs and a regal bearing. As they drove away from the airport, her massive head cast a shadow on the hood of the truck, which made it look like there was an elephant flying above them. Nick thought the truck would tip over around every curve, but Nang said that Miss Pretty had been on many trucks. She knows how to learn, he explained. Miss Pretty did a lot of learning on the three-day trip to the plantation. They traveled on roads that didn't look like roads, past flooded rice paddies by fields being plowed by oxen, through small towns and villages, up mountainsides, beneath dark bamboo forests, across streams and shallow rivers. Nang steered the truck around three more sharp curves. When they reached the rare straightaways, Nick asked him if his mother was ever happy on the plantation. Nang considered this for a moment. Yes, there were times she, she seemed happy, but these were overshadowed shadowed by her fears. What was she afraid of? Everything. Snakes, your father's house, hawk's nest. Christmas Day, Nick said with a smile. Father smuggled me out of the nursery. I was five. Nang laughed. Yes, he took you out while your mother was still asleep. Nick remembered it like it was yesterday. One of the Freestone traditions was to tour the plantation on elephant back on Christmas Day. His mother didn't like the tours and insisted that Nick was too young to participate. But early that evening, his father picked him up out of his bed and tiptoeing down the servant hall past his sleeping nanny, he carried Nick out the back door. Waiting for them, flapping his ears, his truck in trunk investigating the unfamiliar smells coming from the garden was Hannibal. His huge ivory tusks gleamed pink in the early morning light. A wooden bell hung from a rope around his neck. Hannibal was 15 years old at the time, and his father was convinced he would become the plantation's greatest kunjai elephant. We use the kunjai to catch wild elephants and for the most difficult tasks, his father had explained. They are a special breed with a rare combination of strength, intelligence, and courage. Hannibal is all these elements. He ruffled Nick's unruly black hair. And so do you, Nicholas. He tapped Hannibal behind the front knee with his elephant stick or chun, then used 
raised leg as a step to climb up onto his neck. Nang lifted Nick up to him and sitting between his father's legs, Nick went for his first trip on elephant back. When they returned to Hawk's Nest, much later than expected, his parents argued. A few days later, Nick and his mother were on a ship bound for the United States. Nick had developed a mild case of pneumonia, which she insisted on having treated in the United States. After the pneumonia had run its course, his mother's excuse for not returning was that Nick was still too frail, too weak for the tropical climate of Burma. After this, it was his schooling. Then Bernard, an old school friend of hers from New York, came back into her life. She divorced Nick's father, married Bernard, and they moved to London where Bernard was posted with the U.S. Army. When they left Burma in 1933, she had known it was a one-way voyage. Nick was unhappy in London. Despite being British on his father's side, he had a hard time fitting in. He sounded and thought differently from the boys and girls at his school. He was a yank adrift in the sea of Brits, as Bernard put it. Even though his mother had remarried, she didn't interfere with Nick's correspondence or his relationship with his father who wrote to Vic, Nick, several times a year. When a letter arrived from Burma, she placed it unopened on a silver tray in the foyer where Nick was sure to see it. At first, the letters were short and simple, but as Nick got older, they became longer and more involved. His father wanted him to know everything about the tea plantation, past, present, and his plans for the future. He told Nick how his great-grandfather, Sergeant Major Jackson, Theodore Freestone, had mustered out of the British Army after serving in India, bought three elephants with the last of his money, and traveled deep into the Burmese jungle with two elephant drivers, or Mohats, as they were called in India, standing on a broad plateau over a wide river, the sergeant major told the Mahots, we'll build the elephant village down by the river and the plantation house right where we are standing. We will call the house Hawk's Nest. The sergeant major was a great admirer of birds of prey. The plantation was nothing more than a raw jungle. Back then, filled with venomous snakes, leeches, tigers, leopards, flying squirrels, and sun bears. There were pangolin, makake, gaur, hog deer, sambur deer, muntjak, civet, swarms of biting insects, and of course, the wild elephants they planned to capture and train to harvest the valuable timber. In addition to the letters his father sent him, he sent him books about forestry, elephant husbandry, Burmese culture, tropical medicine, and the religion of the country, Buddhism. Some of these books were difficult to understand, but Nick didn't care. He studied them anywhere, anyway, gleaning what information he could. It was a foregone conclusion at least in Nick's mind, that he would one day return to Burma and eventually take over the family forestry business. But in, not until you graduate from the university, his mother had insisted, hoping that by the time Nick's desires for elephants, timber, and the tropics would have diminished. Nick had thought about Burma every day for the past eight years, all he had ever wanted was to return to the plantation. At first, Nick was disappointed that his father hadn't been in Rangoon to meet him, but his disappointment passed away quickly under Nang's cheerful banter. Nang's English was excellent, and his knowledge about the places they drove through was nothing short of astounding. He knew every plant 
tree, and animal they came across. He also seemed to know someone in every village along the route. Whenever they stopped, people appeared with food, pots of green tea, and gossip, which is how information was passed from place to place in the jungle. Very few telephones in Burma, Nang said, or radios, just people with busy mouths. Nang was his father's singgaung, or foreman, in charge of all the timber elephants and mahots on the plantation. In Burma, mahots are called Uzis, Nang explained as they drove, which means men who sits on the neck. And my family has been sitting upon elephants since my grandfather. Taung Ba came here with the Sergeant Major. Nick's father had written to him about Tang Ma, which meant hilltop in Burmese. He was a legend and not just on the plantation, but throughout Burma. He was given the name Hilltop because he was discovered on a hill in India when he was just a few hours old. A group of Mahots working in the forest found him beneath a banyan tree and took him back to their village. His mother and father never stepped forward to claim him. So he was an orphan. By the time he was a teenager, he was the greatest Mahot in all of India. He was said that he knew the secret language of elephants, that he could talk to them as one human speaks to another human. But Hilltop did not like all of the attention his fame brought to him. So when Sergeant Major asked him to come to Burma, he was eager to go. My son Inda, who you will meet at the plantation, Nang continued, is an excellent Mahot. And Mia here is also very excellent with elephants, but in Burma, women cannot become Mahots. A pity, but it is, but it is a tradition. Tradition is tradition. Mia was not nearly as talkative as her father. In fact, she had barely said a word to Nick since they picked him up in Rangoon. She spent most of the long trip looking out the rear window at Miss Pretty. When they stopped for the night, the cow was offloaded and tethered or tied to a tree. Mia went into the forest with her machete or da and cut piles of fodder while Nang prepared their meal, which consisted of rice and whatever meat or fish they had picked up along the way. After dinner, they unrolled their own woven mats and bedded down for the night, serenaded by frogs, crickets, the grunt of sambur deer, and the occasional raspy roar of tigers. Late on the third night, they arrived at the plantation. Nick expected his father to be waiting for him at Hawk's Nest, but once again, he was disappointed. His father wasn't there. Plantation business, the head houseman, Boo Kong, explained apologetically. Very busy. I will show you to your room. He limped up the stairs, helped by a bamboo cane. Chapter Two, The Campfire. After Mia and her father dropped Nick at Hawk's Nest, they tied Miss Pretty to a tree in the jungle and cut enough bamboo to last her through the night. It's late, Mia's father said. We'll leave the truck here and walk. I don't want to wake the village. When they got there, they were surprised to see a campfire burning and several mahots sitting around it, arguing. Mia's father, Nang, put his head on her shoulder and held his fingertip to his lips. They stood in the shadows and listened. Rangoon was bombed today, said one of the mahots. We don't know that for certain. I tell you it's true. The city will fall soon. What if it is true? Rangoon is a long way from there. He's right. Why would the Japanese bother us? My cousin said he saw a patrol not far from here just a week ago. 
It could have been a British patrol. No, they were Japanese. There is no doubt. He was able to get a good look at them. Your cousin is lucky the Japanese didn't see him. The Japanese are not our enemies. Their war is with the British. It is not our war. It's our country. It used to be our country until the British came and took it away. Magway said, Magway's family had been on the plantation as long as Mia's family. His grandfather was a second Mahot the Sergeant Major had brought from India with Hilltop. The Japanese were here to liberate us, Magwe said. If you had any sense, you would know this. How do you know they're here to liberate us? I have my sources. A thorn in Nang's side. Magwe was always second guessing the Singyung's decision and causing problems among the other Mahots. He was lazy, unkind to his elephant, and angry that Mr. Firestone, Mr. Freestone, Nick's father, had made Mia's father the foreman and not him. In Mia's opinion, Mr. Freestone should have knocked him and his family off the plantation long ago, but her father told her that Mr. Freestone would never do that. To do so would be bad luck, he had said. This plantation started with the two Mahots, with their descendants who will always be here. Tradition is important to Mr. Freestone, as it should be. I wouldn't be surprised if Nang and his daughter do not return, Magwe said. Mia nearly said something, but her father anticipated her outburst and he shook his head. They'll be back. Nang will never leave the plantation. You overestimate him, Magwe said. I suspect that Mr. Freestone sent him away to prepare things. Mr. Freestone's son is not, is not coming to Rangoon. Only a fool would have his son come to Burma now. What about Inda? Nag would not leave his son behind. Of course not, Magwe said. Inda is in this with him. But what will they do? Where will they go? Now, those are interesting questions, Magwe answered. It's possible they won't go far. They might stay right here in Burma and fight the Japanese, hiding in the forest, making sneak attacks on our liberators. And who will be punished for those attacks? He paused. We will be punished. Our wives, our children will suffer. Someone will die. And Mr. Freestone will not care. His only concern is for his precious plantation and for the profits he makes on the trees harvested from our sweat and blood. Go home, Nang whispered to Mia, then stepped into the dim light of the campfire. Mia did not go home. Nang squatted down across from Mogwe without a word. He looked at a cherut and asked for one, and someone gave him one. He lit it with an ember from the fire. The other men stared at him like a spirit. He had appeared out of the trees and joined them. Gnats are forest spirits, and almost everything goes wrong on the plantation and is blamed on them. The Mahots built little houses or shrines outside the homes called Natshins and offered the spirits food and other gifts, hoping to keep the gnats happy so they stayed inside the shrines. If the gnats didn't like the offering, they came out and tormented the Mahots and their families. That was the belief and the superstition. Nang looked each man in the eye one at a time. Some looked away. Others like Magwe met his gaze with defiance. Miss Pretty is a beautiful elephant, Nang said. She'll make a fine addition to the herd. And Mr. Freestone's son is a fine boy. He is up at Hawk's Nest. You'll get a chance to meet him tomorrow. He looked at one of the Mahots. Tin, 
How are the two calves doing? The training is going well, Tin answered. We should be able to let them out of the crush sometime this week. Nang turned to another Mahot. Wang Lin, how was Ka Lum's leg? Nearly healed. She will be ready for work in a few days. Good, because we have a lot of work to do. Nang puffed on his chair root and waited. What are they talking about in Rangoon? Someone finally asked. The Japanese, Nang said. We heard that Rangoon was bombed today. It's possible, Nang said. But there were no bombs when we were there. I wouldn't worry about it. The British and our soldiers have set up defense all around the city. They're ready for whatever comes. And if the defense fails, Magwe asked, what then? Nang ignored the question. You all know me, and you know that I believe we should have our independence. What you may not know is that Mr. Freestone also believes Burma should be an independent country governed by its own people. He has been quietly working on this for many years, regardless of what the Japanese have been saying. If they take this country, they will not give us our freedom. They will enslave us. We're slaves now, Magwe said. You are free to come and go as you please under the British. You can leave this plantation any time you like and get a job on another plantation. I agree with our situation here under the British is not ideal, but it will be far worse if the Japanese control us. We've decided to meet at the pagoda tomorrow morning and discuss this, Magwe said. Everyone is invited, including Mr. Freestone, Nang asked. No, Magway answered. He's been gone for three days. He's out with Captain Josephs. Inda is with them. I don't suppose you know where they, they went or what they're doing. Plantation business, I suppose, Nang said, standing up. If we are to meet tomorrow morning, I suggest... You all get some sleep. Chapter three, Hawk's Nest. A warm breeze blew through the screened window of the bedroom, ruffling the mosquito netting around Nick's bed. He opened his eyes and it was still dark out, but by the sounds coming from outside, dawn wasn't far off. He heard people talking and laughing in the distance. A generator motor rumbled somewhere near the house he got up and switched on the overhead light. As he pulled on his pants, a quick movement on the ceiling caught his eye. Lizards, at least a half dozen of them scurrying toward the light to hunt for insects. The larger lizards took up positions closer to the bulb where the hunting was better. One of the smaller lizards made a desperate lunge for a juicy moth, missed and fell on to the mosquito netting Nick tried to free it, but the more he tried, the more tangled it became. It's a nuisance when they get all balled up like that. Nick jumped. Father! Father! He stood at the doorway, grinning with an old rucksack slung over one shoulder, a rifle over the other. It was all Nick could do to stop himself from throwing his arms around him. But he was 14 now. Too old for that. His father stepped into the room. Sorry I couldn't make it to Rangoon to meet you. That's all right. Uh, Nang and Myant took care of me. And how was Miss Pretty? She was no trouble at all. Nick hadn't seen his father since he had visited London two years before. He had aged. His black hair had a little gray in it now. His tea color eyes had sunk deeper into the sockets as if he had lost weight. He hadn't shaved. His clothes were soiled and sweat-stained. During his visits to London, he was always immaculately groomed. In all the photographs Nick had seen of him on the plantation, even on elephant back supervising Mahotes, he was crisply attired. Nick wondered if he had been ill recently. 
malaria was common in Burma, and his father had suffered many bouts of it over the years. How's your mother, he asked. Uh, good, considering the blitz and the apartment burning. She's been really busy at the embassy. I imagine so. And Bernard? Nick shook his head. He's been out of the country for a while. We haven't heard from him. Bernard is resourceful. I'm sure he's fine. His father and Bernard had gotten along very well. You've grown. Eh, a bit, <laughs> Nick said self-consciously. He had gained some weight since the, the war started. School sports had been all but canceled. And with the air raids and curfews, it was difficult to get outside to exercise. He changed the subject. Have you been all out all night? His father nodded and I'm afraid I'm going to have to leave again. But I should be back late this evening or early tomorrow morning. Nick tried to hide his disappointment. I know this is not the kind of homecoming you imagined, but it can't be helped, his father said. When I get back, we'll go out for a, a Christmas ride. Nick had almost forgotten about Christmas. During the long journey from England to Burma, he had lost track of time. What day is it? December 24th, his father said. Someone will be up later this morning to show you around the village. He walked closer to the netting. Now, let's, let's see what we can do about getting this lizard out. He set his rucksack and rifle down. The lizards moved into the house before the sergeant major finished building it. I suppose... They have more right to be here than I do in some respects. They certainly keep the insects under control. The mesh netting had wrapped around the lizard so many times it looks as if it were encased like a cocoon. Not this one, Nick pointed out. His father smiled. When they get this tangled, it's easier just to cut them out and have the net fixed. He handed Nick his pocket knife. The handle was made of ivory. Carved into the ivory was an intricate scene of timber elephants harvesting logs. Nick opened the worn but sharp blade and cut around the wiggling lizard, leaving a hole in the netting big enough for a flying fox to pass through. The mummified lizard squirmed on his palm now what? I'll show you, his father said. His father took the lizard and picked at the netting until he loosened an edge, which he pinched between his thumb and index finger. It's the lizard's tiny claws that cause the trouble with the nets. They get stuck in them. He squatted down and began gently shaking the cocoon just above the floor. With each shake, another layer of netting came loose. You just let gravity sort of take over and sort it out. The lizard dropped to the floor, hissed at them, then skittered under the bed. Nick held out the pocket knife. His father shook his head. I want you to keep it. Oh, I, I couldn't. Nick knew how much the knife meant to his father. The handle had been carved by the Sergeant Major himself. My father gave it to me, and his father gave it to him, he said. It's your turn to have it now. We'll call it an early Christmas present. Nick looked at the knife's yellowed ivory handle. I'll be really careful with it. No, you'll use it like all the Freestones have used it. It's not a priceless heirloom to be taken out on special occasions and shown off. It's a knife, a tool. Use it. Nick put it in his pocket. Thank you. His father reached for his rucksack and rifle. You're going right now? Yes, Inda is meeting me out front. I just came by to... I'll go with you. Nick started digging through his trunk to find a shirt. Not today, Nicholas, his father said gently. 
Nick looked up at him. I go by Nick now. His father nodded, then continued. I need to check out some things. Too many people tagging along could make it a little dicey. You understand? Nick did not understand, but he didn't want to get into an argument with his father the first day on the plantation. At the bottom of his trunk was a small box. He took it out and gave it to his father. What's this? Nick smiled. An early Christmas present for you. Open it. Inside the box was a small diary with pale blue paper and a leather cover. Embossed on the cover in gold letters was his father's name. Nick had found it in a shop down the road from their apartment. It was one of the few things that had survived the fire. His father fanned through the blank pages. It's very nice indeed. And I didn't know if you keep a diary or not. I'll put it to good use. He slipped it in his rucksack. Thank you. I'm sorry for this confusion, Nickel. Nick. Believe me, I, I, I wish circumstances were different. He started for the door, then stopped and looked back. You may hear some rumors when you go get to the village. Don't be alarmed. What kind of rumors? He stared at Nick for a moment. About the Japanese, he said. When we passed through Rangoon, we saw the fortifications and a lot of British soldiers, Nick said. Do you think Japanese is going to invade? They started bombing the city yesterday. Will it affect us here? At some point, yes. His father looked at his watch. I really have to go. We'll talk more about it when I get back. When you're ready, go down to the dining room and they'll serve you breakfast. Again, I'm sorry about this. I'll be fine, Nick said, although he wasn't entirely certain if it were true or not. I'll see you later then. His father turned and walked out of the bedroom. It looks like the war has followed me halfway around the world, Nick thought. Is this why father was out all night? He stepped out onto the veranda, the patio. A red sun was rising above the river, and he got his first glimpse of the elephant village, 200 yards below Hawk's Nest. The villagers were awake and busy. Smoke drifted toward the house from the cooking fires. He breathed in the spicy smell and watched the children feeding the chickens and pigs wandering among the houses. His father had written to him about the village and the people who lived there. The Burmese, both men and women, wear long, colorful skirts called longis. A simple tube of cotton cloth knotted at the waist to keep it up. The villagers' simple one-room houses are made of bamboo and teak and are built on stilts to keep the water out during the monsoon season from mid-May to mid-November. The stilts also discourage snakes from taking up residence inside, and there are many snakes here. The Mahots and their families sleep on the floor on woven mats, which are rolled up when not in use. His father had offered to run electricity down to the village from the generator that supplied Hawk's Nest, but the Mahots declined the offer, preferring to light their homes with the kerosene gas lamps and candles they had always used. The Mahots do not embrace change easily. There is a special place they go to discuss such things. It's called the Pagoda, an ancient ruin the S Sergeant Major discovered soon after he arrived here. It's located half a mile from Hawk's Nest. In the old days before Hawk's Nest was built, the Sergeant Major met the Mahots there every morning before they went out into the forest to work. Nick looked down river. A group of women were making charcoal by burying smoking black embers in the sand along the bank. There were few men in the village. Nick guessed that most of them had already gone into the forest to bring back the elephants. Timber elephants work five or six hours a day during the morning. In the afternoon, it becomes too hot. 
the Mahots set the elephants free to wander where they will during their off hours. Each elephant wears a wooden bell around its neck so the Mahot can find it in the forest. Some elephants wander as many as six miles during the night. If the behavior persists, we put fetters on their front ankles to slow them down. Each bell sounds a little different, and each mahot knows the sound of his elephant's bell. Dangerous elephants are given iron bells, so people know to stay away from them. Hannibal wears one now. A dusty car pulled up in front of the house. A man with red hair and a bushy mustache wearing a military uniform got out. From the veranda, Nick watched his father approach the car and shake the man's hand. They were joined by a Burmese boy, not much older than Nick, wearing a purple longji. His father gave the boy a broad grin. That must be Inda, Nick thought. Nang's son, why is he going with them and not me? Nick waved, but they didn't see him. They got into the car and drove away. Before going down to breakfast, Nick decided to look around upstairs. When he was young, he hadn't been allowed on the second floor. His mother was afraid he would fall down the stairs, and his father was afraid he would disturb the house guests, of which there were many back then. The nearest town of any size was over 60 miles away and a two-day trip during the dry season and nearly impossible during the monsoon, except on elephant back. When visitors came, they usually spent several nights. There were seven bedrooms upstairs, three large bedrooms at the front of the house and four smaller ones at the back, each with a private bathroom. The rooms were nearly identical with dark hardwood paneling and small fireplaces. Above each fireplace, was a magnificently, magnificently carved elephant, a theme carried throughout the house. Even at five years old, Nick had thought the fireplaces were an odd touch in the tropics, where it's very hot. His mother had told him that Sergeant Major was a little quirky and had designed the house with a fireplace in nearly every room to remind him of the chilly, cold nights in England. Each bedroom was furnished with a large bed draped with mosquito netting, a writing desk, a vanity, a dresser, and a wardrobe. The teak wood floors were covered with thick oriental rugs. The back bedrooms had a view of the garden, which was just as Nick remembered it. When he was little, he was allowed to play out there, but only after the gardener checked out all the bushes for snakes. The reflecting pools were clear enough to see the koi fish feeding on the bottom. The hedges were neatly trimmed and the paths looked as if they had been raked that morning. Nick was happy to see his father was still maintaining it. He had wondered if he would after his mother left. She loved that garden. Between the back bedrooms was a flight of stairs leading down to the servants' quarters and Nick's old nursery which was near the kitchen. This is where he spent most of his time. He could still close his eyes and recall the quarters, every nook and cranny. The servants' rooms were not nearly as grand as the upstairs bedroom, but it was a happy place. His parents had been good to the servants, and the servants had been very kind to him. The three front bedrooms overlooked the river and the elephant village. Nick's bedroom was on the left, the room in the middle was unoccupied, and the third room was his father's. He stood in his father's doorway. The bed was still made, verifying he had not slept in it the previous night. Next to the bed was a reading chair and a table with two photographs in a small hinged frame. He stepped inside for a closer look. The first was a photo of Nick sitting between his father's legs on top of Hannibal. The second was a photo, photo of his grandfather holding him when he was a baby. His grandfather had died when Nick was six months old. Sitting next to the table lamp was a stack of books. He scanned the titles, 
Bushido and the Samurai, The Rising Sun, Japan's Rise to Power, Matsao Basho, Japan's Master Poet, English Japanese Dictionary, and many others. It looked like his father had been preparing for the Japanese for some time. Nick left the bedroom and walked down the stairs to the ground floor. The entryway was checked, checkered with black and white tiles, which had always reminded him of a giant chessboard. The front door was big enough to let a small elephant through. He pulled it open, then closed it with a satisfied smile. When he was little, no matter how hard he tried, he could not move that door. To the right of the entry was his father's office and library, the largest room in the house, and by far Nick's favorite place when he was young. Along the walls were the floor-to-ceiling shelves filled with books. In the center of the room was a huge desk carved out of a single piece of teak wood by the sergeant major. The desk was called the helm because this is where most of the plantation decisions were made. Nick used to play under the desk nearly every day while his father worked on plantation business above. His favorite game was to protect the helm from invading enemies with his lead soldiers. He got down on his knees and felt under the desk for the old cigar box he used to store the soldiers in and was surprised to find it exactly where he'd left it. His toy army had not deserted the helm. On the wall behind the desk was yet another fireplace, but this fireplace was much bigger than the ones in the bedroom. And there was another difference. It was filled with ashes. Nick set the cigar box on the desk and walked over to it. The ashes were still warm. Hmm, someone, his father, he thought, had started a fire that morning. Why? It was at least 80 degrees in the house. He wandered over to the walk-in vault to the left of the fireplace. A heavy steel door was closed and locked. The inside, he remembered, was lined with filing cabinets where all the plantation papers and other correspondence and other valuables were kept. Had his father been burning files, he wondered? He walked back to the fireplace. Above the mantel were three large portraits. The one on the left was the sergeant major in his military uniform riding a, a tusker, an elephant, into the forest. The portrait in the middle was his grandfather, Jackson Theodore Freestone II, sitting at the helm, taking care of plantation business. Nick's father was in the portrait on the right. Like the sergeant major, he was sitting on a huge elephant, but crouched in front of the bull was a tiger ready to pounce. The bull's ears were flared, his trunk curled under, ready to strike. An iron bell hung around his neck. Hannibal. His father had written him many letters about the famous bull, and Nick wasn't surprised to see him in the portrait. Five years earlier, during a course of a single night, Hannibal had been transformed from a tusked kunjai into the most feared and dangerous animal on the plantation. A tiger had attacked him. The wounds healed, but Hannibal was never the same after that. Nick stared at the portraits for a long time. He saw himself in the men, the black hair, the prominent hawk-like nose. His physique was different though. He wasn't nearly as thin and hard as the men in the portraits. Another difference was in the eyes. Theirs were dark and piercing. Nick's were green, like his mother's. But he had inherited another trait from the men, one that could not be seen in the portraits. Something his mother called freestone blood. The freestones were brash, stubborn, and had bad tempers. At one time or another, she had warned, all of the Freestone men have gotten into trouble because of their Freestone blood. It will be your undoing if you don't learn to control it, she said. As Nick looked around the library, he began to feel uneasy. 
One day he would be sitting behind the helm in charge of the Mahots, the servants, the elephants, the trees, the village, Hawk's Nest, all of it. How was he going to learn everything he needed to know? He hadn't been raised here like the men in the portraits. He felt a sudden urge to get out from under the freestone's piercing stares. He didn't like them staring at him. Nick returned to the box of soldiers, and then he put it in its hiding place. As he stepped back into the entry hall, he had another realization. Aside from his father, he hadn't seen anyone else in the house. When he was young, the house had been filled with activity, especially in the morning. A parade of people streaming in and out of the front door, cleaning, setting flowers in every room, making beds, dusting, polishing, sweeping. He rushed into the servants' quarters. They were empty. The only movement came from the whirling ceiling fans. The house was immaculately cleaned, but where were the servants? He stepped into his old nursery, expecting to see it totally changed. After all, it had been nine years since he'd been there, but to his surprise, the nursery, his bedroom, was exactly the same. His crib was still in the corner. Next to it was a small bed, which he had graduated to not long before he left Burma. On the nightstand was his reading lamp with a cowboy and Indian shade. Opposite the bed was a small fireplace, where he'd once believed the boogeyman hid. The window was covered with an iron gate, the only window in the house that was, something his mother had insisted on. He opened the toy box and found his six shooters, stuffed animals, books, puzzles, balls, airplanes, trucks, blocks. Strange his father would leave everything as it was. He wasn't the sentimental type. Had he thought we were coming back? He left the nursery and walked down the hallway to the kitchen. Surely there would be people there. Every pot and pan hung in its place. The sinks were gleaming, the counters wiped down, the floor swept, the griddle warm to the touch, but there were no cooks or servants. What's going on here, he wondered. He pushed open the swinging door to the dining room. A long table was set for one person. He took the silver cover off the plate Scrambled eggs, bacon, toast. Next to the plate was a pot of tea. All of it warm, but not hot. Clearly, it had been sitting there a while. Desperate to talk to someone, he grabbed a slice of toast and left the house. Chapter 4, The Elephant Village In his hurry to get to the village, Nick nearly ran over a Buddhist monk walking up the trail. I, I, I beg your pardon, Nick stammered out of the breath, embarrassed. The monk smiled, but said nothing. He was old, most of his teeth were missing, and those that remained were stained orange from chewing betel nut, a mild narcotic that grew wild in the forest. His head was shaved. He wore a faded saffron-colored robe, tattered and muddy at the hem, where it dragged on the ground. He was carrying a black enameled alms bowl. Nick put his hand together in front of his face and bowed the traditional Buddhist greeting. The monk returned the bow. On the trip from Rangoon, Nick had seen dozens of Buddhist monks. Sometimes they walked along, alone, sometimes in groups, carrying their bowls. Because they were not allowed to kill anything, including plants, they had to rely on the kindness of strangers to eat. When people put food in their bowls, they received a blessing in return. The monks were not allowed to refuse an offering. They could not take more food than the bowl held, and the food had to be eaten before midday, their only meal of the day. Nick was still holding the toast he had taken from the table he held it out, and the monk opened the bowl's lid with a trembling hand. As Nick put the toast inside, he saw that it was the only offering the monk had received that day. He wondered if the monk's trembling hands were caused by his age or by hunger. 
I'm Nick Freestone. The monk smiled, but he did not respond. Jackson Freestone's son, Nick added. The monk remained silent. Nick pointed up the trail. There's no one at the house, and I just came from there. Do you know where everyone is? The monk's expression did not change. Nick figured he didn't understand English, or else he had taken a vow of silence. Whatever the reason, it was clear he wasn't going to answer his question. Nick was about to say goodbye and continue down to the village when he remembered the food he left on the dining room table. Oh, wait here. Nick motioned for the monk to stay where he was. I'll be right back. He ran back up the trail to the house, took two quick bites of the scrambled egg, ate a piece of bacon, scrapped the rest, scraped the rest into the napkin, then ran back down the trail. The monk hadn't moved. It's not much, but it's good. He stuffed the food into the bowl, filling it almost to the top. The monk bowed his head and mumbled some words Nick didn't understand, then continued up the trail towards Hawk's Nest. The monk bowed his head again as he left. There's no one up there, Nick told him again, but the monk didn't turn around. Nick sh stared after him for a moment, then turned and walked the rest of the way down the trail to the elephant village. Except for a few chickens pecking in the dirt, pigs wallowing in the mud, and a couple of dogs lounging in the shade, the village was deserted. This explained the monk's empty bowl. But where were all the people he'd seen from the balcony like an hour ago? Nick climbed the steps of the nearest house. Hello? Is anyone here? He stuck his head inside. There was no front door, no glass or screens on the windows, no mosquito netting, no furniture. Along one wall was a shelf with a few bowls and cooking utensils, an old calendar with a photo of a snow-covered mountain hung on another wall. In one corner was a metal bucket filled with charcoal. The sleeping mats were rolled up in another corner. The only color came from the longji skirt hanging on nails. Nick began to think he should have waited at Hawk's Nest for the Mahot who was going to show him around. Maybe the guide is up there right now, wondering where I am, he thought. Nick hurried down the rickety stairs and started back through the village, but something stopped him. A sound, metal on metal, faint, but growing louder. He waited, listening. A shadow appeared behind a house 30 feet in front of him. He glanced at the animals, all of them, the pigs, the goat, the dogs, even the chickens were also staring at the shadow. Something yellowish, dense, as big around as a lamppost appeared from behind the house, followed by a massive gray trunk, then a head, ears, legs the size of small trees, the biggest animal he had ever, he had ever seen stepped out into the open. Nick forgot to breathe, metal on metal, the iron bell, Hannibal. The bull raised his trunk, smelling the air as he drew closer. Paralyzed with fear and awe, Nick could not seem to make his legs move. Hannibal's right ear was torn. The left tusk was two feet shorter than the right. Scars ran from the top of his head to the base of his trunk. The tiger's claws plowed deep. Nick couldn't see them, but he knew from his father's letters there were more scars on his flanks and back. The iron bell fell silent. Hannibal stood in front of Nick with his tusks inches from Nick's chest. Nick told himself to run, but his legs remained rooted in place as the terrible ways elephants kill echoed through his head. 
impale you with a tusk, stomp on you with their feet, throw you, bash you against a tree, crush your head on their mouths, do a headstand on your chest. The cows were generally passive, but the bulls are an entirely different story. You can rely on a bull, but you can never give him your complete trust. With little warning, he will turn on you as quickly and deadly as a cobra. Nick never saw the hit coming. One moment he was looking at Hannibal's ragged scars, the next he was flying backward, the last ounce of air knocked from his lungs. He hit the ground on his back. His chest felt as if it were on fire. Hannibal walked over and stood above him, one yellow tusk neatly scraping the ground. Impale, stomp, bash, crush. Nick had never felt terror like this numbness, acceptance of the inevitable. He was going to die in a dusty Burmese elephant village. Hannibal ran the wet tip of his trunk all over Nick's body, then did something totally unexpected. He walked away. Metal on metal, the sound of the iron bell around his neck faded. Drenched in sweat, Nick took in several painful gulps of air, got shakily to his feet, and looked in the direction the elephant had taken. Hannibal wasn't there. Chapter 5, The Guide Mia knocked on the front door of Hawk's Nest, but there was no answer. The boy must still be asleep, she thought. She didn't blame him. Mia was tired, too. If her father hadn't woken her for the meeting at the pagoda, she would still be on her sleeping mat dreaming of Miss Pretty. She knocked on the front door again. When there was still no answer, she sat down on the steps to wait. The meeting that morning was more of the same, with her father and Mogwe arguing about what to do if the war came to the plantation. The other villagers seemed evenly divided, some siding with the British, the others thinking a Japanese occupation would be good. Mia had no opinion one way or another. Regardless of who occupied the country, she would never become a Mahot which was all she ever wanted or ever cared about. When she was a little girl, she trained village dogs to let her ride them. When she outgrew the dogs, she rode the pigs, and after that, the oxen. Her father and the other villagers were amazed at her ability with animals. She's fearless. There isn't an animal alive May can't train. She must have been a great mahot in her former life. She is as good with animals as her brother, Inda. It's a shame she was in, reincarnated as a girl instead of a boy. Her father and aunt Kinkin thought she would grow up and give up on becoming a mahot as she got older. Elephants are dangerous, Mia, her father had lectured her on more than one occasion. It's one thing to ride a village pig or a dog. Those are domestic animals. Elephants are wild and cooperate with us out of kindness when their mood is right. I have personally known seven Mahots who have been killed by elephants. If working with elephants is so dangerous, why have you encouraged Inda to become a Mahot? Mia would ask. Certainly you love him as much as you love me. Inda is a man, and all the men in our family have been Mahots. It's the tradition. And as a man, he is much stronger than you. S stronger than his elephant? Of course not, her father said. Have you ever met a Mahot stronger than his elephant? No. So strength has little to do with controlling an elephant. I'm not talking about physical strength. Then what kind of strength are you talking about? 
Her father would throw his hands up in the air whenever they argued. It's tradition. Women are not allowed to become mahots. It's bad luck to even think about it. Aunt Kinkin, who had raised Mia after her mother had died, was no less stringent in her objections to Mia's wish, but she used a completely different argument. There is no place in the deep forest for a young woman, or an old woman, or for that matter. When Mahouts get off by themselves, they become as wild as gnats. They are completely different than they are in the village under the influence of women. You're too young to understand, but you wouldn't want to be out in the deep forest with them. Every time something went wrong, you would be blamed for it because you're a woman. You need to let this go. Mia had tried to do exactly as they asked. But when her father invited her to pick up Miss Pretty, her desire to become a Mahot returned stronger than ever. She could not seem to take her eyes off the elegant Kunjai. It was as if she had known Miss Pretty since she was a calf. Impossible because Miss Pretty was nearly three times as old as Mia. But still, there was something between them, something she knew was there, and she had stayed up pondering most of the night. Mia left the pagoda long before the meeting was over. Her father had asked her to check on Miss Pretty then, and then go up to the hawk's nest to meet Nick and show him around the village. She was surprised her father had asked. Normally when a new elephant was brought to the plantation, a mahot was assigned him immediately and he took over the responsibilities for the elephant's needs. And being asked to show Nick around was even more unusual. In Mr. Freestone's absence, her father or a senior mahot should have been picked to do this. Mia was eager to do both tasks. In fact, she had stayed well out of her father's way all morning in case he changed his mind. Mia had checked on Miss Pretty before going up to Hawk's Nest and found she'd eaten all of the bamboo they had cut the night before and had stripped every branch in reach. When Miss Pretty saw Mia, she started flapping her ears and thumping her trunk on the ground. Thirsty, Ma said. Hungry too, I suppose. I can get you some water, but... I didn't bring my da, so food will have will be more difficult to find. But I'll see what I can do. She found the water bucket, which had a few extra dents from Miss Pretty's kicking it around during the night. I see you have a little temper when things aren't going your way. She filled the bucket in the stream and brought it back. Mias steadied the bucket, careful to stay just out of Miss Pretty's reach while she eagerly sucked the water up and threw it into her mouth. The first and second buckets were emptied quickly, but with the third, Miss Pretty took her time, which allowed Mia to think a little, a little more about what, why her father had given her this honor of taking care of the elephant, Miss Pretty. Perhaps he's changed his mind about me becoming a Mahot. Why else would he ask me to help him pick up Miss Pretty? She wondered. Was the trip a test to see if I'm still interested in elephants? Mia had been very good the past month. She had sneaked over to the elephant training camp only once in that entire time. She couldn't resist. Two five-year-old calves had been taken from their mothers and started their training. Mia had sat hidden in a tree hour after hour, ignoring the biting insects and mos other mosquitoes, and even the green tree snake until it slithered a little too close, forcing her to climb higher to get out of its way. The only trouble with sneaking was that she could not tell anything about it afterward. Back at the house, she had to listen in frustrating silence as Inda and her father discussed how the training was going. She didn't dare offer her opinions because that would give her away. But today will be different, she thought. Today I can ask any question. I can ask any question I want and go wherever I please, including the training camp, because I will be with Nick Freestone. 
Father did not put any restrictions on me, and there are certainly no restrictions on where Nick Freestone can go. Enough, she asked Miss Pretty. If you quit pulling on your rope and stop fretting so much, you'll be more comfortable. I'll get you a little bit of food, and then I have to go. She went back to the stream and gathered an armful of bamboo, wishing she had remembered her daw. A real mahot always had a daw strapped around his waist and his chun in his hand. Inda made her a chun when she was eight years old. It wasn't a very good one. The iron tip was dull and the handle was made of bamboo instead of teak, but it had worked well enough on pigs and oxen. She would have to ask him to make her a proper tune, one that Miss Pretty would respect. Listen to me, she said aloud. Father's not going to give me Miss Pretty. She lay the bamboo in front of Miss Pretty. The pile looked pitifully small in front of the big elephant, but that was all she could do for the moment. I'll be right back with Nick Freestone and give you some more. Mia had left Miss Pretty two hours ago and was still sitting on the porch waiting impatiently for Nick to wake up. How long can someone sleep? Perhaps I should go back down and check on Miss Pretty again. She stood up and was about to do just that when Nick came stumbling up the path from the village. His clothes were smeared with dirt and sweat and his face was as red as a betel nut. His raised, he raised his arm in greeting uh, then grimaced in obvious pain. I thought you were still inside, Mia said. What happened to you? I walked down to the village. Mia stared at his clothes. He looked like he had rolled down to the village. Oh, Nick said, brushing away some dirt. I, I just um, slipped when I was coming up the path. He wasn't about to tell her that Hannibal had knocked him down. Where is everyone? You're the first person I've talked to except for my father and an old monk. Your father is here? Mia asked in surprise. Mr. Freestone and Inda weren't expected back until the following day. Not anymore. He stopped in for a moment early this morning, but he had to leave again. Was Inda with him? Yes, at least I think he was. They were with a British officer with red hair. Captain Josephs. Why hadn't Inda stopped by to see her? She wondered. He, was, he usually did when he was near the village. The village had a meeting this morning, she said. At the pagoda? Yes, Mia. She was surprised he knew about the pagoda. That explains where everyone was, Nick said. Well, I guess I better go in and get cleaned up. Someone is supposed to come by to show me around. I'm that someone. You? Mia nodded. He looked a little disappointed. If you're not feeling up to it, I could... No, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I just need to get into some clean clothes. It'll only take a few minutes. Do you want to wait outside? It's cooler. He opened the front door. I'll wait here, Mia said, staying put on the porch. It was a well-known fact that Hawk's Nest was haunted. <laughs>